Let's unpack more of the doctrine of self-defense as an affirmative defense. We look at the way the law deals with the defendant whose use of force is disproportionate to any threat she could reasonably have perceived. Recall the facts of the Getz case. Suppose that Getz stated that he wasn't afraid of getting mugged, but that he was afraid of getting a wedgie. I assume you know what a wedgie is, also called a laundry mark. In case you don't know, don't bother with it. Let's simply stipulate that being given a wedgie is uncomfortable and humiliating, but a wedgie does not involve serious bodily harm. If that was all that Getz had feared, would he have been privileged to use force of any kind to avoid it? Would he have been privileged to use deadly force if he reasonably believed he could avoid being given a wedgie no other way? We do well to consult the model penal code because this area of the law can easily get murky if we lose sight of the basics. The use of force upon another person is justifiable when the actor believes that such force is immediately necessary for the purpose of protecting himself against the use of unlawful force by such other person on the present occasion. On the present occasion means not in retaliation after the necessity has passed and not preemptively before the use of force becomes unavoidable. This is the first basic rule. The defendant's use of force upon or toward another person is justifiable when, but only when faced with a threat of unlawful force. Why does it say believes and not reasonably believes? We will come back to that. What is meant by unlawful force? Unlawful force means force, including confinement, which constitutes an offense or actionable tort. A wedgie is unlawful force. It is at least a tortious offensive touching, even if it is not a defined offense in the jurisdiction. A defendant is not privileged to use force at all unless she believes she is faced with the imminent threat of unlawful force. A defendant's belief that her victim is using or threatening to use unlawful force is a precondition to her having, her having a right to use any force in self-defense. Now, supposing the defendant believes she is faced with the threat of imminent unlawful force, how much force may she use in self-defense? This is the question of proportionality. Here is where the distinction between deadly and non-deadly comes into play. This distinction can apply to force either by the defendant or by the victim. But as we shall see, it applies to each in a different way. We come to the second basic rule of self-defense. The model penal code proposes it in these terms. The use of deadly force is not justifiable unless the actor believes that such force is necessary to protect himself against death, serious bodily harm, kidnapping, or sexual intercourse compelled by force or threat. This sets a higher bar of justification. Apprehension of any kind of unlawful force can justify the use of non-deadly force. That's rule number one. But to justify the use of deadly force, force known to risk or meant to inflict death or serious bodily harm, there must be apprehension of more than mere unlawful force. There would be a neat symmetry if what was required to justify deadly force is the apprehension of a deadly threat. And sometimes rule number two is formulated in this simple, easy way. Only a deadly threat can justify using deadly force. But the model rule refers to other things in addition. Death, serious bodily harm, kidnapping, or forcible intercourse. For simplicity, we can still refer to deadly threat as long as we bear this in mind. On the defendant's part, how are we to understand this deadly force that the defendant can justifiably use only to resist death, other serious bodily harm, kidnapping, or rape. The model penal code 
defines the concept of deadly force this way. Deadly force means force which the actor uses with the purpose of causing or which he knows to create a risk of causing death or serious bodily harm. The key here is risk of serious bodily harm. Normally, pushing a person away would not risk causing serious bodily harm or death. From now on, I'm just going to say serious bodily harm and not death or serious bodily harm. Death is serious bodily harm. Some people simplify further and speak of SBH rather than serious bodily harm. You may do so too if you like. Punching someone in the nose is not obviously to risk serious bodily harm normally, but it is a closer case. If Evander Holyfield punches Pee Wee Herman in the nose, well, you get the idea. What about pulling out a knife or a gun to resist unlawful force? Is this using deadly force? The model penal code answers, a threat to cause death or serious bodily harm by the production of a weapon or otherwise does not per se constitute the use of deadly force. The commentary to this section goes on to say, purposely firing a firearm in the direction of another person or at a vehicle in which another person is believed to be constitutes deadly force. A threat to cause death or serious bodily harm by the production of a weapon or otherwise, so long as the actor's purpose is limited to creating an apprehension that he will use deadly force if necessary, does not constitute deadly force. What about firing a warning shot? The model penal code does not count a careful warning shot as deadly force, but there is case law to the contrary. A recent Florida case goes so far as to say that firing a firearm in the air, even as a so-called warning shot, constitutes as a matter of law the use of deadly force. What about aiming? Again, the model penal code does not count mere aiming a gun as using deadly force. We will see in a moment why this matters. Before we proceed though, notice how the symmetry breaks down. The same act by the defendant that might not count as the use of deadly force might easily count as a deadly threat if the victim is the actor. An uplifted knife is not the use of deadly force under the model penal code, but in the victim's hands, an uplifted knife can be apprehended as an immediate threat of serious bodily harm. How would gets fare under the model penal code as compared to New York law? Well, in one way better, but in another way worse. Let me explain. First, we look closely at the New York statute. The legislature used the model penal code as a go-by, but made significant alterations. One difference is that New York adds another circumstance that can justify the use of deadly force. There's deadly physical force, kidnapping, rape, sodomy, or robbery. A fact finder might be persuaded that Getz reasonably feared being robbed, but not being killed or kidnapped. Robbery we can define in a rough and ready way as a theft accomplished by force or threat of force. We can understand why the model penal code added kidnapping and rape to its list of threats that can justify the use of deadly force. Typically, the victims of such crimes would reasonably fear that death impends. Even so, we can imagine cases in which, say, Abel nonviolently confines Baker overnight for the sole purpose of making Baker miss a business opportunity, and Baker knows this. Even so, the model penal code seems to authorize Baker to use deadly force to escape if Baker believes that's the only way to get away. The idea is that the typical kidnapping and typical rape are so objectionable that the law should not condemn the use of deadly force to escape them. New York merely added robbery to this list. 
So in this way, Getz does better under the New York statute than under the model penal code. But in another way, Getz should do worse. Recall that the New York statute requires the fact finder to find that the defendant reasonably believed he faced the designated kind of threat. This is objective. Reasonable to Getz doesn't cut it. And surely you notice that the model penal code does not say reasonably believes. All it says is believes. And it is easier to persuade a fact finder that Getz believed he faced threats and necessities that no reasonable person in his situation would. A reasonable person in Getz's situation would remember the time he had earlier turned away Mugger simply by using non-deadly force. Not so fast, though. The model penal code sneaks the objective reasonableness condition back in via a separate section. When the actor is reckless or negligent in having such belief, the justification is unavailable in a prosecution for an offense for which recklessness or negligence suffices to establish culpability. So, if Daryl Cabey had died, and the jury was persuaded that Getz had been reckless in thinking, sincerely though, he needed to shoot KB twice to avoid KB doing him serious bodily harm, Getz would be convictable of manslaughter, but not murder, under the model penal code. Read it again. When the actor is reckless or negligent in having such belief, the justification is unavailable in a prosecution for an offense for which recklessness or negligence suffices to establish culpability. KB lived, and so keeping the same stipulations under the model penal code, Getz would be convictable of attempted manslaughter, wouldn't he? This is a remarkably difficult question of MPC interpretation, which we will set aside. The point here is simply that the drafters of the model penal code wanted to reproduce the traditional but minority distinction between so-called perfect and imperfect self-defense. Many courts felt that one who unreasonably, mistakenly, but sincerely uses force in self-defense ought not to be punished as severely as another who used force but without those sincere beliefs. We will explore next time how the imperfect perfect distinction has shaped the outcomes in actual cases.